Hey, all right, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Heal Thyself. We are in our episode number 20, out of the teen years, ready to go. Thank God for 20 episodes. Thank you all for supporting. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, giving love to the show. I appreciate it so much. I have so much gratitude. Thank you so much. All right. Today's show is packed with information. I know that you're all going to take notes. I know you're all going to go home and say, all right, maybe I need to start this. All right. Maybe I need to call this person. All right. Maybe I need to stop eating this. So why don't we just get started and go right into the knowledge bomb. All right. For the knowledge bomb, I want to start off with a quote that is really powerful. It was by Benjamin Franklin. And he said, the best medicines of all are resting and fasting. Now, you know where I'm going with this. This whole knowledge bomb is going to be on fasting. It's so hot right now. People are talking about it. It's the thing. Is it real? Does it benefit us? Is it not good for us? What are the benefits? Anyway, so why don't we go into it? Let me say this. First and foremost, what is fasting? Fasting is the abstinence of food or drink, okay? But in this context, when I talk about fasting, it's going to be uh, reduction of food uh, or cessation of food and just drink, okay? We have evolved with fasting. We have to really understand that. It is an evolutionary process that is very familiar to the body. It is not alien. We know that the less you eat, the longer you live. I'll go back to saying that. The less you eat, the longer you live. Longevity is associated with a reduction in uh, intake of food. So one of the head uh, speakers on fasting, he's a researcher, he's awesome, his name's Walter Longo down in USC. He speaks about longevity and fasting. And he said that a fasting state is more natural than the fed state. And actually, food is a bigger stress to our state than fasting. So let's keep that for perspective because fasting is certainly not an alien thing or an alien practice for us. It's something that is very much so natural, very much so in line, and it's something we evolved with. Okay, so the the whole three meals a day is very is a cultural thing that began years ago. Um, they say back actually to Roman times, but it really was pushed about three meals being eaten, particularly in the morning uh, at, in the early 20s and the 30s, because that's when the government really was promoting breakfast and being the most important meal of the day for all of the industrial workers uh, to have a hearty meal to sustain them during the day. So when I speak about fasting, I want to go into more intermittent fasting, right? Intermittent fasting is basically a timed approach to eating. Some of the common ones are eating uh, or fasting 14 to 16 hours and then eating in an eight hour window. So like, let's say 16 hour fast, eight hour window of eating. Another one is just uh, during the week having 24 hour fast, maybe two to three times a week. Um, the f- in the fasted state, what we see is a lot of benefits. Okay. So first and foremost, when you're fasting, what happens in the body is that there is at some point, you're, well, you're not eating, so you're, you're not giving your body that sugar, the glucose to go into your cells. So at some point, that's, that, that's just completely worn out. No more glucose for the body. And then we start breaking it down from our liver. Well, then at some point, those storages start breaking down. And that some point usually is about the belief is it's it's 12 to 16 hours of fasting, and then you start pr- breaking down fatty acids, ketones, and that is your primary source of energy. Your body's so smart that it goes, all right, well, you're not giving me this fuel, so let me just go to another fuel because we have to sustain life or you're going to die. So uh, we take these ketones, and they're really therapeutic. That's the whole premise of the ketone diet. The problem with the ketone diet is that there's no long-term studies to show that it's safe, and it traditionally is focused around high-fat animal product, animal-based foods, which we know are absolutely not connected to longevity, um, do a lot more bad in the body than quote-unquote good, okay? So fasting, what the heck does it do? What's What's happening in my body in this fasted state? Well, 
let's start with hormones. You start releasing this uh, human growth hormone. And what that is, it's basically the anti-aging hormone in our body, right? It helps us build muscle and helps us burn down fat and it's excellent for weight loss. We see a lowering of insulin, right? This is another good thing for weight loss, right? You want lower blood sugar and so many other things like cancer even. Uh, what you want is that insulin to be low, right? So there's not excess amounts of blood sugar going in the body, right? So what we see is not only a decrease in blood sugar, but a decrease in insulin, and thus also decreases in insulin resistant, which is amazing. <clears throat> there you go, right there for diabetics. So as far as the blood sugar reduction, it's three to 6%, and an insulin is 20 to 31% on in a fasted state. We also see weight loss, but we see it in the important areas. Visceral fat. Visceral fat is the disease promoting weight loss. It's the one that is connected to multitude of diseases, cardiovascular disease. That's what we don't want. Visceral fat is a fat around the organs. And what we see is that there's a decrease in visceral fat. There's a decrease in waist cir circumference. And that's already seen on day two of just the fast. Um, we also see genetic repair and recovery and those genes that are associated with longevity they're increasing, they're, high, they're more expressed in the body. If, that, if you thought that that's not good enough, another beautiful thing is, and I'm not done, another beautiful thing is reduction of inflammation. What we see is that inflammation is one of the number one indicators for long-term health. And in the centenarians, which are the folks around the world, the, uh, the areas and the blue zones that are concentrated with centenarians, people over 100, and all of them have very low levels of inflammation, um, particularly two inflammatory markers, CRP and, and IL-6 and toluquin-6. Those are pro-inflammatory markers that, are, that really drop pretty low when you're, doing, when you're in a fasted state. Uh, it also increased the production of antioxidants, amazing stuff. How about heart? Well, there's a lot of studies in, in fasted populations where we see a lowering of CRP, that's just generalized inflammation, homocysteine, another marker of heart disease, and then triglycerides in HDL, HDL ratio. So the, the tri triglycerides go down, HDL goes up, really cool. And as I mentioned, um, a reduction in also, or a reduction in LDL. So for cancer, preliminarily what we're seeing in animal studies is that it's preventative, uh, especially when those animals are, um, when, when, they, when they're treated with conventional cancer treatments. Basically what happens is when you're in a fasted state, there is a protection of the healthy cells, but the cancer cells, which have a different metabolism, really hyper-utilizing sugar and amino acids, well, they're sensitized now. So that sensitization, sensitization process is, is putting them at, at risk for conventional therapy. So what I'm saying is that let's say you do go the conventional therapy route and you are getting chemo, you should talk to your doctor about what fasting can do for the body because what we're seeing is that the healthy cells that are usually uh, get an atomic bomb uh, from chemo and that are, they're affected just as much as cancer cells, well now they're being protected and the cancer cells are becoming vulnerable. So it's really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, and, you're, and, and if there is someone with cancer, your oncologist should know about these studies that are coming out or how to how to recommend for that, okay? And brain health, I had a whole show on brain health. BDNF, I mentioned that from a few shows ago, it increases that protein. So uh, it's increasing the communication between nerves, the growth of nerves. It's found to be increasing myelin. Myelin is the conduction layer outside of the nerves, and then it's protecting against Alzheimer's. But one of the most important elements of fasting is a process called autophagy. What happens in this process, it's a metabolic process, and I call it spring cleaning, although you can do it any season. But this cleaning is sort of taking tabs on your body, cleaning out all the crap, wiping out the debris, repair, creating cellular repair in the body, uh, creating new stem cells, thus becoming different types of cells like white blood cells. It helps balance uh, the different types of blood cells to the ratios that they should be in a healthy ratio, reducing again inflammation in this state, uh, reducing blood sugar in this state. Um, the difference between this fasted autophagy state, which 
they say it usually happens around 48 to 72 hours, which is why I always say intermittent fasting is wonderful to start creating those ketones and start creating a lot of these positive uh, benefits of fasting. But I also do believe that everyone should either do a two to three day fast once every quarter or some people do a week long fast, but do that with your practitioner, or making sure that it's safe and, and or doing maybe a fasting mimicking diet. Regardless, when you go for an extended amount of time, like 48 or 72 hours without food, which is very much so evolutionarily in line with the way we evolved, that's creating this process of autophagy. And the difference between caloric restriction and intermittent fasting and or extended amount of fasting is that in the caloric restriction uh, diet, what you're doing is you're continuously having that refeeding, but in that autophagy that happens in 48 to 72 hours of fasting, what happens is in that refeeding phase, that's what's building up the system that is on a lower level during the fast, right? It's sort of doing the spring cleaning, spring cleaning, and then when you're refeeding, that's doing the rebuilding. So what we see is uh, IGF-1, that's what helped build muscle, reduce weight. Well, that starts building up again. BDNF is starting to build up again. The white blood cells, which were lower reducing, are starting to build up again from the stem cells at a balanced, uh, a balanced level, right? The myeloid, the lymphoid lines, they're becoming balanced. Um, the new white blood cells are not being prone to the autoimmune process that we're seeing. So it's so protective for cancer, neurodegeneration, cardiometabolic disease, autoimmune disease. And the, the one of the most interesting parts of this rebuilding phase is that it helps rebuild the myelin on the nervous system. And that myelin is the outer coating of these nerve cells that help conduction happen in the body, which is really interesting for folks with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, MS. So really awesome stuff. Also, we're seeing protection of the DNA, um, enhancing, again, like I said, the immune cells. So fasting for me is not even a practice that should be uh, implemented. Fasting is something that should be part of our lifestyle, right? As I mentioned before, and as Walter Longo in that incredible quote said, there's more stress with feeding than there is with fasting. Our body knows what it is to fast. Think about evolutionary wise, right? We were certainly not going to the supermarket. Uh, we certainly weren't uh, having access to food all day like we do now. There was times our, our, our systems evolved in fasted states, right? So it's very much so recognizable to our system. So who shouldn't fast? Well, if you're underweight, if you have an eating disorder, if you have issues with your adrenal glands, with your immune system, then speak to your practitioner, see if it's safe. Um, but all of the other folks, it, I think at least intermittent fasting wise, you know, doing 14 hours and up uh, between your last meal and the next day, the first meal would be beneficial just as a starting point. And if you're worried about doing a two to three day fast, then you know, start doing some research, look up some YouTube videos, talk to other people, see, see what they did to, to help them. And then again, as I mentioned, the fasting mimicking diet is another diet by Prolon, P-R-O-L-O-N. They, you can actually eat during this uh, low caloric foods, which do not affect you the way that food, I, this is very interesting to me, but do, doesn't affect you the way that uh, food will as far as blood sugar wise, such that it mimics a fast Interesting stuff. Uh, it's something that I'm going to be trying to. So yeah, fasting. I'm not a. I'm not a fan. I'm a big fan. I'm an advocate of it. You all should try fasting. Whew. All right. I didn't breathe, and we have a breath coach coming in, so she's not going to be happy about that. Um, let us go to the product review. All right, today's product review is going to be on chocolate. Who doesn't love chocolate? I think I think I read somewhere a while ago there's only like 10% of people in America who do not like chocolate. And um, those none of those people are my friends. There is always some sort of chocolate bar in my house. And I always want access to it. But... There are some caveats when it comes to chocolate. We need to talk about it. So dark chocolate is the one, when I say chocolate, I'm referring to dark chocolate. That is the one that is has the therapeutic benefits, not milk chocolate. Milk chocolate may have some, some, but it's not something we're gonna talk about. 
Regardless, uh, antioxidants, minerals like magnesium has anti-inflammatory effects, uh, positively affects blood pressure, heart, brain. Um, so dark chocolate is so chock full of antioxidants. It's really beautiful. It's, 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 a, it's a universal gift. And you'll let you see how much I like my chocolate. But we need to talk a little bit about something. The, um, there was a, there's an independent nonprofit group called As You Sow. They did, um, they conducted a, a, an independent study with 120 different chocolate products and they tested for th certain indicators, those being lead and cadmium. Those are two of the most uh, abundant heavy metals. Well, that's a problem because what they saw was 96 of the 127 chocolates that were tested came back with levels of lead and cadmium that surpassed California's uh, daily level of, of consumption. And the question is why? So it, initially it was believed that these metals were in the soil and the beans were sucking them up. And then, um, and then that was, it was just a, a function of the soil. But actually there was a few studies, one by the environmental health perspective that looked uh, at different studies. They didn't conduct a study, but they looked at different studies throughout the world and they concluded that basically only a small amount is coming from soil. So most of it is coming either from uh, pesticides, from spraying, uh, yes, some soil contamination, and a lot of it is coming from the manufacturing process and shipping. So that's interesting, right? Because if you think about it, indigenous cultures were eating chocolate. Did they all have lead poisoning? Did they all have cadmium poisoning? Um, so I am a believer that it's less in the soil and more in the processing and more in the things that are used on it. Um, so the problem is with these two heavy metals is that lead, we, I know we've all heard of lead. There's no safe level of lead. Although there's an, a, a, a daily allowance in California, which is really low, there's still no, no safe level, especially for children. Children are number one susceptible to lead poisoning and it affects the brains, the hormones, the heart, the kidneys, um, your, your immune system, the blood, uh, it builds up in the bones. Cadmium uh, also affects the uh, skeletal system. Like I said, the, kidney, the kidneys, respiratory system, reproductive system. In California, the maximum uh, daily allowable dose of lead is 0.5 micrograms per day. 0.5 micrograms per day. Remember that number. But also there's no safe level, but that's the level that they, they, they say. And it's, that's, that's pretty low. For cadmium, it's 4.1 micrograms per day. Okay, 0.5 and 4.1. So in this test, what they found, and there's a lot of these chocolates that you'll know, what they found is that in the context of lead, so let's start with lead, right? 0.5 micrograms per day. The 365 organic, organic one, organic does not mean that it's devoid of heavy metals. The 365 organic from Whole Foods had 6.0 micrograms per serving, okay? 6.0 micrograms per serving, not 0.5 micrograms, 6.0 per serving. And I'm going to ask you how many people have one serving, right? One serving is usually one or two cubes for this. It's, oh, this one's five sections. Um, you know, I know people who eat the whole bar to be honest. Um, and then there's, there's another one that you can get is organic. It's the Theo dark chocolate one that have 4.5 micrograms per serving. Also found up there, the Trader Joe's ones, the Sprouts, the Sun Food, Endangered Species had some of them up there. The Lint, Hershey's, Gelson's, uh, Dagoba, TCHO, Ghirardelli's, Lily's, Equal Exchange, Lake Champlain, Seas Candies, Kroger, Dove, Nestle, Starbucks. And I urge you all yourself to go on the As You Sow um, website and you'll see the study and access the study yourself and you'll see. But all of these companies that I named all had lead over 0.5 micrograms per, per day and they all had it in a serving over that. So really interesting stuff as far as cadmium. As I said, cadmium's 4.1 micrograms per day. Um, Newman's own had 40.2 micrograms per serving. Earth Circle Organics had 33.6 micrograms per serving. Another ones that were up there, Theo, Trader Joe's, TCHO, Hershey's, Ghirardelli, Whole Foods, Kroger, Taza, Equal Exchange, Lake Champlain, Godiva, Lint, Justin's Cups, uh, Aldi. I might have broke your heart on a few of those, but. Yeah, I mean, it, the, that's it's disheartening. The one I brought on today is the Alter Eco one, and um, the interesting thing is, is I couldn't find much information um, about how me, how much lead is in here or cadmium. Um, it's organic, which is really the first main step when you buy chocolate. You really shouldn't buy chocolate that's not organic, but 
that's a first main step, but remember, it doesn't insure heavy metals. Okay, so some of the better brands are Chuao, C-H-U-A-O, Creo Endangered Species Chocolate. I mentioned that they, they do have some of them that were tested for high levels of lead and cadmium, but the one that had low levels was a natural dark chocolate, 72% um, cocoa. Uh, and there's another one called Yes, Cacao, Phykine, Corosau, um, Wildly Organic, and Wilderness Poets. Those are the ones that I found or have been told about uh, having really low levels of their organic and having low levels of heavy metals. Um, I want to say a piece actually on on this. The, uh, when we think of chocolate, okay, but the cacao powder is some of the most concentrated forms of heavy metals. Pay close attention to this. Remember I said that lead is 0.5 micrograms per day. The now organic, now brand organic cacao powder is 7.5 micrograms of lead per serving. That's 15 times higher. Conversely, the sun food one, which is, is, is almost just as popular, is 3.6, seven times higher. And then for cadmium, I said that 4.1 micrograms per uh, day is the uh, allowable amount in California. Well, the now organic has 10.8, that's 2.6 times higher, but the sun food has 53.2 uh, micrograms per serving, which is 13 times higher. So you understand now, cacao powder can be a really heavy concentrated dose, up to 15 times more amount of lead that is allowable in a day per serving, and up to 13 times higher amounts of cadmium, um, two of the most concerning um, heavy metals, as I mentioned. So uh, in light of all of these studies coming out, these independent studies, there was uh, 20 legal notices that were filed to Trader Joe's, Hershey's, Mars, you know, Kroger, Whole Foods, all of these companies. And in 2018, I believe, the all these legal efforts basically culminated to 31 companies now independently testing for heavy metals, some of them being Cargill, Hershey's, Mars, and Nestle. Great. That's, that's the first step, and that's really good to hear. Um, and they're finding feasible measures on how to lower it also. So that was a lot, but it's something that we need to pay close attention to. So in front of me here, I have the Alter Eco one. As I mentioned, uh, organic, really important because a lot of these Alter Eco bars have a lot of other ingredients that can be highly sprayed with pesticides. So organic is automatically something that we need to look for in our chocolate bars. Um, as I mentioned, as far as this one, I couldn't get any info on heavy metals, but I did mention a few. Um, but look, this is what you do. You call the company. You say, hey, I'm concerned about lead and cadmium. Send me a report. If they're not sending you a report or they're holding back, then that's a big issue. That's something that Nativas apparently was doing with their cacao powder. They didn't want to or they didn't speak about their heavy metals, which is concerning. So um, I also brought in a Hershey's one here. And I mean, I, I kind of didn't even want to buy it because they, I can't even return it. So now I'm stuck with this Hershey's bar. But uh, let's just let, let let me just tell you what. And here's the here's the interesting thing: the the less dark the chocolate, the the less amount of heavy metals. The higher amount of chocolate, the more amount of heavy metals. Well, why? It's because it's pure. It's more concentrated. Um, but the trade-off is that you're getting milk, and many many times the chocolate that you're getting, the milk chocolate, is coming from or non-organic. Uh, fed cows, uh, highly inflammatory. You know how I feel about milk. I did a whole episode on it. Um, but this one here has milk, chocolate, sugar, just plain old sugar. It doesn't tell anytime you see sugar, it's not necessarily cane sugar. It's usually coming from sugar beets that are genetically modified. Um, this one has uh, milk fat, soy lecithin. Remember, soy always needs to be organic and natural flavors. That's an umbrella term for who knows what? I did a I did a, se a segment on natural flavors. We don't we still don't even know what's in that. Uh, almonds, non organic. I did a whole segment in the beginning uh, of one of my first shows was talking about uh, orga uh, non organic almonds being sprayed, and then sunflower oil, which is one of the more inflammatory oils. So I mean, look, I'm sure this tastes good. I haven't eaten it since 1996, but still, I mean, like there's so many other choices now as opposed to 10 years ago. So we can always make a better choice. Here's the final thought on chocolate. 
I mentioned a few brands. Um, we know that those do better as far as organic and non-heavy metals. That's really cool to hear. Um, so check out those brands. Go online and see if you can um, order some if you love chocolate so much. The other side of it is that if you are not going to order it and you're going to buy organic chocolate at your local grocery store, then fine, okay? And even if I mentioned some of them that are like the Justin's Cups or the TCH, TCHO, um, the Whole Foods, the Trader Joe's, go ahead and buy them, but just don't overdo it, right? If it says serving size, don't go past the serving size. And I'm actually going to say this right now. After all of this research and learning, I, I'm not a fan of cacao powder at all. Um, I don't think that people should be having it because of that being the most concentrated form of heavy metals. Certainly don't give your kids cacao powder. I'm not a fan right now. Um, I'm going to advise actually against cacao powder. I'm okay with chocolate so long as it's eaten moderately, unless you're going to get some of the brands that do test for the heavy metals, and then you can be a little bit more liberal. Um, yeah, I love, look, at the end of the day, I have this alter eco thing. I'll have a few from here, maybe a little bit high in lead, maybe a little bit high in cadmium. I'll have a few, fine. But what I'm going to also do is make sure that I always have accessible, those really high quality ones too. So I really hope that helped. I hope you are now empowered on how to look for chocolate. And let's go to our special guest. I've been waiting for a while. So let's get her on. This is going to be really good. All right, everyone, our special guest today is my personal breath coach. I've done some work with her. She's amazing. I really wanted to bring her on because the simplicity of breathing is an oversight for so many of us, and she is going to drop some knowledge and teach us how to do the most basic stuff, like breathe, uh, and other things, too. Her name is Gwen Dittmar. She's one of my personal friends, and I got a lot of love for her. Welcome, Gwen. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you it's for great coming. to be here with you. Yeah, right before July 4th. Yeah, see you in your office. Yeah, you yeah. You usually come to my office. That's true. That's true. I usually <laughs> I do. in office. So uh, let's let's tell the audience and listeners what happened. I, I came to one of your sessions yes. with so much resistance. Yes, right. a lot of resistance. And that's very common. Why? Very common. Because when you do that breath work, you, you are going to bypass your mind and you're going to go into a different state of consciousness. And mm -hmm. so your ego, small self, basic self, knows that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it can kind of... Uh, create some resistance. Sometimes it can even create, you know, delays, traffic, yeah. accidents. Yeah. I've, I've seen accidents happen too. It sure does. That and those those energies are at work inside of us, like mm. really trying to prevent us from the higher consciousness and prevent us from that deeper state of love. Yeah, and deeper state of love is an understatement because that was such a powerful class, which I want to go mm -hmm. into. But as far as the egoic resistance, I mean, it took me maybe two to three months just to get to the class, right? right? And and yeah, yeah, I'm going to come to the session. I didn't go. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to come. I didn't go. And, and then, no no judgment about that either. Like, yeah, I yeah. don't ever have judgment about that because I I understand what's, what's working behind the scenes. So it's really just like sending love to it mm -hmm. and just letting it know that when it's ready, it's welcome. And that also too, there's divine timing. So there, there will be divine time that's going to yeah. be working things out so that when somebody does arrive to do it, it's the perfect time for them to do it. Something really interesting um, that I found uh, within that resistance is, is I was literally at the front door and, <laughs> and I was ringing and no one was, was coming to the front because everyone was in the back of the house. Right. And I was like, well, no one's here, so I might as well leave. Even though as I'm walking, I hear people and I'm like, oh, okay, I need to make this <laughs> jump and just go ahead and do it. So mm -hmm. Um, but that was one of the best experiences I've had. Mm -hmm. Transcendent. And sometimes the things we resist the most are the things that are going to be the deepest medicine for us. Yeah. And that's, that was exactly the case. It was, it was big time resistance and deep, deep medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, so bypassing ego yes. and going into this higher state of consciousness, but is that what the basis of breath work is, is that we quiet the mind and get to an altered state? 
I would say there's different types of breath work. So there's breath work techniques, and then I think there's breath work healing. And in this type of breath work healing, yeah, you, you're going to start to look at what's behind the physical, the mental, the emotional, and even the spiritual, and look at what's, what's behind it on an energetic sense, like a psychic sense. And because and, a lot of times there is a lot of energy that's not ours, that's in our energetic system. Mm -hmm. And so when you can go into that and start to clear that out, mm -hmm then you're able to have all of your energy back to yourself. You're able to connect to your own energy. Yeah, and it was a, a pretty incredible session because remember I said that I don't, I'm never, I'm not a crier. I, right. I, I kind of grew up not crying. When my mom passed, I didn't cry much. Mm. Um, and, and since I haven't cried much, there's not many times where I cried in my life. Mm -hmm. But the power of what happened there, I was like, I, it, it was funny because as I was doing the breath work, the the physical manifestation of tears were coming out, but I didn't understand why. Right. Because my mind was like, what's this? This is a very foreign mm -hmm. uh, thing that's going on in my body. And oftentimes people will cry. They will have that experience that their their eyes are crying, but they are not really even thinking about something. They're not processing something because you're not in your mind. If you yeah. do that breath over and over again, you're, you're really going to bypass your mind, which is what a lot of people are looking for is mm -hmm. to get out of the head because they spend so much time in their head. And then you get to just have your energy clearing itself out. So sometimes the crying is just like a cleansing. It's just a clearing. Yeah. It's, it's exactly true because there was no logical reasoning behind tears. You weren't thinking yeah. about anything and you, cause usually like when we're in this third dimension in this human state, we're like our thoughts create our feelings and then our feelings usually create our physical response or reaction or choice. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if I think my job sucks, I'm not, I'm going to feel like down or depressed or like not want to go to work. And then that's going to oftentimes create like self-sabotage or waking yeah. up late or just like resisting going to work and yeah. doing that. So that's usually what we do in like human state. Whereas when you pop into that breath work, you're, you're not thinking and then feeling and then making choices because you, you're literally not in that brain state anymore. You're in a different state. So you get to work with like whatever energy is underneath of it, usually unconscious yeah. or energy that like we've often picked up from other people and we don't even know that it's like inside, mm -hmm. but that that also also gets to come out. It is crazy. I was listening to a podcast the other day talking about how our body processes so much faster than the brain. Mm. Uh, but so all of these packets of trauma get stored throughout our body and our cells. They do. And, and because we don't know how to properly process, for example, like when an antelope runs away from a lion, lion doesn't catch it, it runs out of breath, the antelope will breathe and breathe and breathe and, and release all of that excess totally. energy, uh, those hormones, and just come back and then start eating grass like it never happened. And often shaking. I've heard yeah. shaking is just like a natural mm -hmm. response that most mammals do, yeah. whereas humans don't shake. You know, no. like after you have like an argument with somebody, you don't sit there and shake. Yeah, yeah. But that's actually what we, we probably need to do. Yeah. Um, and that's why a lot of times people, like I'll be... I'll be just doing a coaching session versus a breath work session and I'll hear people go. <sighs> mm -hmm. So it's just a natural inherent response inside of us to, to clear out yeah. the energy that somebody's having and, and, and get that out of the body. So it's not in there anymore. Yeah. That's so true because I've been in situations where when I'm finally trying to integrate that, that just comes mm -hmm. that, that breath, that Naturally. clearing breath. Yeah. Your body already is on top of it. It's the mind that's stopping your body from processing correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not supposed to shake. What am I doing here? Let me not shake. Right. Even or I I'm have not supposed urge. to take a deep breath. Yeah. Or I'm not supposed to scream. Yeah, exactly. Or I'm not supposed to like want to like punch something, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, my kids, like they pretty clearly express and get energy out. Like if they're upset about something, they scream or they hit something or they, they move. Yeah. They, or they, you know, they lay down on the floor and just like breathe because they're, that's what, that's what, you, how you get the energy out. Yeah. They haven't developed the ego enough to say, Hey, wait, society says I'm not supposed to do this. So let me not do this. I think we, as people need to find routes, how to better integrate these stresses and traumas mm -hmm. that we 
that we face sometimes daily, sometimes yearly, monthly, yeah. whatever it is. Um, and so I think trauma, like you, I think trauma is a totally untapped, um, I don't know what you would call it, industry or like a whole field opportunity in medicine, yeah. because trauma does get stored in the body and then no one's really treating that, that energy that gets stored in the body. And then that energy, you know, that starts to manifest into dis ease. Yeah, I, I firmly agree with that. Look, if we are at our basic level energy, why wouldn't we start with health interventions first there mm -hmm. and then go from you know, more low vibration levels. Yeah. So that's, that's really cool. And there's different that. types of trauma. I think that's the other mis misconception that a lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, oh, well, I wasn't abused or I didn't have, you know, sexual abuse or, you know, my family was like pretty, pretty average, mm -hmm. but there's little traumas. So there's like BT, big T and then little T. So there's little traumas that start to happen over time, yeah. um, just maybe like an avoidance of how some how a child feels or um, disregarding or like you're yeah. not supposed to cry or yeah. hold that in or be strong or be tough. Like there, there's a lot of little traumas that happen over time. And those are often, I mean, I see people that come to me with like big trauma and we can clear and, and work that through. But a lot of times it's a lot of these little traumas that start to build up over time and become big because yeah. there's so many layers of little. Yeah, I hear that all the time. Sometimes I'm with cancer patients and I talk about traumas. They're like, oh, well, I, I can't remember anything big. Like I had a pretty good dad, pretty good mom. I've never been raped. And then that's that's what they mm -hmm. chalk up as trauma without understanding that, yeah, it's an accumulation of life circumstances yeah. that happen. And when we're young, we're so impressionable and we're so sensitive and we take all that in, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. even as adults too, we just block that. Yep. Um, and I, and that's like a lot of what the breath work does is that like we have like, you know, if we're all these, if we're 37 trillion cells just vibrating, like mm -hmm. if we're just energy, but then they all come together and they start to form a mass that looks like a body, right? Yeah. That looks like bones, that looks like tissue and muscles. All the, that energy comes together and it starts to create like a threading, like a weaving. Mm -hmm. But like you said, like as children, we're open. We're just open sponges and we're, we're taking everything in to make sense of like, okay, what is healthy? What's not healthy? What's aligned for me? What's not aligned for me? Who am I? Who am I not? And then if things start to come in this big open sponge and they're not really who we are, then those energies kind of get trapped like inside yeah. of our energetic threading as it starts to close and we yeah. form, you know, like who am I? What is my ego? What keeps me safe? What keeps me protected? And then, but those energies are still inside of you. And yeah. I find that that's where the breath work goes is it goes into a lot of that energy that's inside and it starts to like pull a lot of that out that's not yours and it lets it come up and out through the breath so that you then have that open space for whatever universal life force or yeah. love or just your own energy to come back into your body. Yeah, that's beautiful stuff. And I agree so much about holding in those emotions and disease. There's a lot of shamanic cultures that believe that cancer is just, you know, stored up traumas and emotions yeah. and these shamans are teaching people how to release it. That's mm -hmm. amazing. So in your experience and you have all of these clients coming in doing breath work, it is, is it helping just traumas or like, just let's, let's get an idea about what's the power of breath work. Yeah. I mean, I really feel like it's for everything and anything. It can be, you know, judgments, it can be beliefs, it can be patterns, it can be traumas, it can be, you know, I've worked with people that have different disease states, different illnesses, um, sexual abuse energy, which is like pretty prevalent. I mean, almost, you know, my breathwork teacher, David Elliott, like he really goes into that a lot in his books and in his training that most, most people have that, that some form of that energy inside of them, whether it be something actually physically happened or it was something that psychically happened, or it was just something that was passed down through their lineage or their ancestral, mm -hmm. their ancestral line, but that we have a lot of that that's, that's stored in, in your reproductive area, which is known as your second chakra. And so that area holds your sensuality, your sexuality, your creativity, your finances and your abundance, your prosperity. Mm -hmm. So those are all linked together. So so oftentimes, um, you know, if there's something that's, that's, if there's an energy in there that's not yours, or if, or if you're not accessed 
to have all of that energy, then sometimes that can start to show up in your creativity and your expression and your your connection to your own, you know, sensuality and um, you know, and not even sex wise, but just like pleasure for sure in the in yourself and yeah. in the world. Yeah. I, I love that when you talk about clearing that because when you do that work and whatever modality it is, when you feel that flow of blood and energy, you know mm -hmm. something just opened up. Totally. And right. a lot of times that's how it feels for people is it's just like, you know, a tingling or a vibration. Um, and that's how you like today I did a breathwork session with a woman in um, Dallas and, you know, virtually. And she was like, you know, feeling a lot of the, you know, either the first the first round of symptoms or just experience, which is, is that it's like a little bit maybe tearful or mm. emotional or physical and feeling you know, like either a tightness or a heaviness or like a cold sensation in the body. And then it starts to, as that starts to clear out, it's like then like her own energy starts to come back in and she started feeling really warm and very tingly yeah. and like vibrating. Yeah. And she's like, what is that? What's happening? <laughs> I'm like, that's your, your prana. That's your chi. That's your own energy getting to come back into your body. Yeah. And, and, and then you get to live from that energy so cool. versus having to figure things out or yeah. having a little heart moment, but then coming back into the head yeah. or having a gut reaction about something, but bypassing it because your head is saying something. The breath like work, like really teaches your body how to circulate from its own energy source versus having to like figure things out. Yeah. I can attest that being in a flow state mm -hmm. as such is the most powerful thing. It really the, is. The, the, I can't explain how much I can create from that, how much I can access. I go, oh, I didn't know how to do this. How am I doing this? I didn't know I had this knowledge. How do I have this knowledge? There's something so powerful, so ingrained, mm -hmm. so ancient with that. And we're just stuck in our heads. It is. And I mean, your breath is everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like I've watched my children like take their first breath. And last year I watched my mother like take her last breath. Mm. And like, I've had a near death experience. So I've like felt what it feels like to not breathe anymore. And then to come back into bre breath. Wow. And that is, it is your life force. So yeah. I feel like we, we do have this m immense capacity to enter into whether you want to call it love or flow or just light or yeah. something bigger than you that you get to feel it moving through you. Cause it is true. A lot of people will ask me like, Oh my gosh, how do you have so much energy and to do, do a lot of these things? I'm like, it's because I, I really, I breathe every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm conscious consciously of my breath. breathing. Right. I, I hold my breath every day, all day. So I know exactly Taking just becoming. Yeah. <sighs> right. Yeah. So breath work is for people who've never even heard of it. Is mm -hmm. it, is it a matter of just sitting or laying down and, uh, repetition breathing for X amount of time. How does this work for people? I know it's different for different yeah. practitioners, but well, I mean, yeah. And there is, I think it's a broad term. So it's funny. Like even last week I was working with somebody, I forget where she was in Colorado or something, but she's like, Oh yeah, I've done breath work before. I've done it before. So we laid down to, you know, she laid down in her home. We were virtual and then she started to do it. She's like, Oh, I've never done this before. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is totally different, but there are different techniques. It's I think similar to yoga and to meditation. And then there's different healing modalities of it. So more of the techniques are things you can do like while you're sitting here, or while you're having a conversation, while you're sitting with a patient, um, you know, and then you, the, the healing, I would say, is the things that you would do more like in a container, more of a sacred container, whether you're doing it by yourself or you're doing it with a group of people, or you're doing it one on one. Yeah. But yeah, you can do a lot of different techniques that can start to teach your body how to access more of its own oxygen capacity and and you know more of its own life force so like the um the four seven eight is one mm -hmm. i think that i shared with you, you did the, the, one of the, the first, first calls. conversations yeah the first calls you said all right before i go <laughs> christian i want you to do this yes and then i was like well what is it and you told me and i did it i did it the rest of the days but what is it what, four, so seven, that one the four seven eight i believe that comes from i think it's called relaxing breathing from mm -hmm. andrew do you pronounce it while or wheel well, wheel. Wheel. And so it's, um, you breathe in through your nose over four, you hold for seven, and then you exhale for eight out of the mouth. 
And so what that one does is it teaches the, the body how to take in a little bit less since we take in so much. Um, and then it teaches the body how to pause between stimulus and response. So holding it for that seven seconds. And then I always love to add in the little extra of like, we have seven chakras. We have these seven oh, energy I systems see. in the body. Yeah. So it's like, you can even just, as you're holding for seven, you can just imagine your breath, like moving through all seven chakras, just cleansing them out. And then when you exhale, you can let all of that energy, any of that energetic debris that's not yours that you picked up, come out through the mouth. Um, that one's really great for just relaxing your body and just bringing your maybe like I don't even know probably brings down your cortisol and yeah yeah, yeah. That's down so your nervous it, system. It activates parasympathetic. Yes. That, that exhalation breath is going to activate that parasympathetic. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cortisol, uh, adrenaline is going mm-hmm. down. Your digestion is getting better. It's activating that. Yeah. Blood's flowing away from your muscles to your core. That's that's beautiful breathing. And I can attest that because. I have been consciously stretching and consciously breathing, not necessarily mm-hmm. even doing yoga, just mm-hmm. paying attention to a certain amount of stretches and breathing within. Why are you doing it? it? It's it's day and night. Usually I'm breathing. Even just then, you just did it. Yeah, you yeah. You just like went like this yeah, yeah, and like yeah. came back to do it. So yeah. even just like the minutia is so important too, like paying attention, like you said, to the body. The body knows. Yeah, yeah. Being in the body, that's that's probably the most important thing. So you're doing... The, the breath work you do, mm-hmm. I came to your session and that was in your house, but you do also Skype for people. I do. Which do is virtual. so accessible. It is. Yeah. Anyone can work with you then. Totally. That's amazing. Yeah. And it, and it actually is just as effective. You know, some people, if they have worked with me in person and then they, they may not want to do it virtually, but the reason why it's, it's pretty much the same is because number one, it's energy. So it's like, you know, I have like Reiki training and um, some other forms of like shamanic like training. And so it's just really about accessing energy and yeah. allowing yourself to channel energy. But then also, too, is it's your breath. Mm-hmm. As much as I would love to think that it has something to do with me, it has nothing to do with me. Even if I'm somebody this weekend said it very beautifully. I think um, her name was Ellen Vora. She's like a holistic psychiatrist. She was just like, yeah, but you were like creating the alchemy. Like you were creating the space for it, but then yes, like we do get to tap into our own breath. So, and your breath is inside of you and you have access to that healing inside of you. And it's, it's your healer. It's your guide. It's your, it's your guru. Yeah. Yeah. You're the facilitator within our own inherent healing mechanisms. You have it all inside of you. That's medicine. That's how medicine should be. You have it all in you, right? Be your own healer. Exactly. It's the, it's the innate intelligence. Like, yes. If you're just setting up the space, as she said, Mm -hmm. or setting up the conditions, Mm -hmm. then our body is going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. It does. And I I feel like sometimes for some, for, you know, maybe in the beginning, it is nice to have somebody creating that container for you. Because if you're learning something new, I know when I'm learning something new, I love having somebody show me how to do it, whether it's going to a doctor or a healer and then having like them hold the space and say, okay, there's a lot of information online, but like, this is what really might be great for you. Yeah. Or, you know, if I'm learning a new skill, like I love having somebody hold space for me Yeah. and having that outside perspective. Um, because you know, sometimes there could be trauma that could come up. There could be things that you're unconscious of that could rise up to the surface. And so I do feel in the beginning, it is wise to have somebody with you so that you can, um, yeah, you can have somebody that's there to, to process and to hold that space for you if stuff does come up. Because oftentimes it does. Yeah. I know for me, like the first time I did breath work, I was like, oh, wow, I had, you know, meditated for years and done kundalini yoga for eight years and regular yoga. And I was marathoner and triathloner and I was a coach and like, you know, Reiki healer. And, but a lot of stuff came up and I was very surprised by it. And if I had not had all of that training that I had, I probably would not have known what to do with what came up or, you know, maybe I just wouldn't have felt comfortable doing it again because a lot did come up. And sometimes that happens with this particular, like the David Elliott form of breath work, like a lot can rise up to the surface if it's been dormant and it's been pushed down. Yeah. What I find is, uh, I've been meditating for like 12 years now. That is more transcendent on a day to day, Mm -hmm. right? Like it just changes your personality such that you're Mm -hmm. just at peace. Mm -hmm. There's not much that really bothers you when you're consistently meditating and you have really good perspective, but the breath work was 
so powerful. The way actually I likened it was to psychedelics, like that experience mm -hmm. when you're doing it for, I don't know, we did it for 20 minutes maybe. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, I know this state. This is the same state that happens when you're on right. psychedelics. And, and, you know, aside from all of those, um, all, all the stigma behind that, at the end of the day, it's just teaching you. It's holding that space, like you said. Yeah. It's, it's the facilitator, right? You were the mushrooms, basically, right. like that. And you put right. us in that place to integrate that trauma or let the body know release. what to do, release. Yeah. yeah, release. And then I think also, too, like a lot of what people, you know, we've been talking about a lot about trauma and like releasing things out of the body. A lot of times people have an experience of like, oh, my gosh, I get it now. Yeah. Like, oh, now I feel like I'm awake. I feel like I understand why I'm here, what I'm supposed to be doing. That's incredible. Or, you know, I, I remember it. Yeah. Because that's that's it's inherent just a remembrance. Yeah, of it's you. a remembrance. Yes. It, it, it's like we just forgot. So it's people just like we... get a chance to wake back up into that. Yeah. Or sometimes, you know, people have experiences of yeah, like seeing visions or like receiving downloads or information. Like I have a lot of um, CEOs that I work with and they're like they they come, you know, every every quarter or like every six months because they're like i'm ready for like the next like download of what i'm supposed to be oh, doing wow that's amazing yeah that's amazing I, what i know when i went it was like the first order of business was releasing what the body was holding <laughs> no downloads no anything my body said we're not we don't want we don't want to digest anything we got to spew it up mm -hmm. first and that's and that what happens it was. with some psychedelics also yeah. like a lot sometimes things need to come up and out yeah. before you can receive the universal connection. Yeah, it, it, I love breath work. Yeah, I'm ready for the next class. Yay! I really am. It's, I'm excited it's to have amazing. you come again. Yeah, we were talking a little bit, just to shift gears a little bit, mm -hmm. um, within this context, but about um, the judgment and the fear that's attached to, like, the feelings behind that that's attached to, like, things like self sabotaging or mm -hmm. not being aware of what your own purpose is. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. there's a lot of uh, listeners and viewers who would be interested, how can I empower myself better? Mm -hmm. What else can I do? Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's go into that. Yeah, like what's like the first, what's the first, uh, prescription yeah, pad? Yeah. Yeah. What's the first <laughs> thing on the prescription pad really? Mm, that's a great question. I would say kind of what you said along the lines of meditation. I feel like a lot of times meditations, do you find that people come to you saying that it's hard for them to meditate? So a lot because yeah. it's hard for them to quiet what the mind, what they think is them the whole life. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think like a lot of times why breath work is like speaking to people is because it's um, like people are operating at a very chaotic and stimulated space inside yeah. of themselves. Even if they look like they're calm outside, they may be very activated <laughs> inside. And I feel like meditation is more of a, like a calmer um, vibration. Yeah. Even though it's a high vibration, it's still like operating at a calmer um, energetic. So it's really hard for people to access access it because they're vibrating up here, yeah. but they're trying to use a medicine that's like working down here. Mm -hmm. So I feel like sometimes like when people have that experience of the breath work, it like, it allows them to then come down to this level where they're like, Oh, that's maybe what meditation feels like yeah. to not. Yeah. And, then, and then I find it's easier for them to do um, a daily practice. But, you know, I would say along the lines of meditation, it's about becoming aware of your thoughts and becoming aware of the, the things that you're, you're, you're judging yourself for or yeah. the beliefs that you're buying into. Yeah. Um, I mean, even yesterday I was talking with, you know, a, another CEO of a pretty big company and, you know, you know, he said, I, well, like I have to do that for my work. And I was like, well, let's just pause and look at that thought, you know, like, is that thought true? Like, you know, and, and he was like, well, yeah, of course that's true. Like I have to do that for my work. And then I just said, well, is that like the ultimate truth? Like, mm -hmm. like there's no other option around that. And he's like, well, I don't, maybe, maybe not. It mm -hmm. seems like it is. And I'm like, well, how do you feel when you think that thought that you have to do that? And he's like, oh, I feel like pretty, 
limited. I feel pretty stuck. I feel pretty trapped. Yeah. And I'm like, and who would you be if you didn't have that thought operating inside of you? He's like, well, I would probably feel a lot less anxious and I would feel a lot more free. Mm. I'm like, okay, well then you can just look at that one thought you know, in the whole conversation we were having. And it's that one thought is creating that much anxiety and that much um, discord inside of you. So it's like about identifying it and then saying, you know, oh, wow, I forgive myself for buying into that belief. I forgive myself for buying into the, like that judgment that I don't have a choice. And then, you know, when because then what the truth is, is like, I actually do have a choice. And I think when people can remember that they have a choice of what they are thinking or what thoughts that they choose to engage in, that's what creates the empowerment. Even if they choose to keep doing that one thing, right? Yeah. So like at the end of the conversation, that person was, you know, he said, well, I am going to keep choosing to do that part of my work. He's like, but now I feel like I actually do have a choice of whether I want to keep doing that or not. And choosing it actually makes me feel really empowered about it, even if it's not something I like doing or that I want to keep doing. Yeah. I know that I can choose that if I want to. Yeah. And I can also choose not to do it. It would probably be difficult. You know, it would be probably difficult to not do that thing as a part of my business, but I actually do have a choice if I want to. Yeah. So I think it's the judgments and the thoughts and the beliefs that we tell ourselves. And listen, I mean, they can be very tricky. They can be very sneaky, mm -hmm. just like the breath work and, and like the resistance and like not, not coming yeah. or not really wanting to yeah. go there. I think our, our beliefs and our thoughts can be very um, sneaky yeah, they in how they, how, they, how they work with us and tell us that that is true, but maybe it's not really true. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is too esoteric. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, that's the basis of me. You know, I was esoteric before I was a doctor. Right. Right. I was, like I say, I'm a, I'm a hippie doc. Right. And, I love and, that. And, and like that is, that's important for people to understand that whatever the situation you have, if so long as you have perspective, you can always choose mm -hmm. to react very differently mm -hmm. and we always do have a choice right totally and i would say like if somebody's not able to observe the thoughts just yet that they are somebody who's still in a stage where they're noticing that they're anxious and they're upset then start there and say you know, I do that a lot, like with the coaching, it's just like, and even with the breath work, we do it in a different way, but it's like, okay, go into the body where, so you're feeling anxious or you're feeling nervous or you're feeling scared or you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling sad. Those are like a lot yeah. of the primary feelings that people are having um, and go into it. And I always say to people like, close your eyes because if your eyes are open, you're still taking in all that stimulation in your peripheral vision um, and it's making your mind think. Mm -hmm. So like close your eyes and go in and where are you feeling that in your body? Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling anxious, you know, like, a, like that's become like a very big word that we use often. And so it's like, oh, well, I'm feeling that in my shoulders or I'm feeling that in my chest or I'm feeling it yeah. actually in my stomach. Yeah or I'm feeling it in my head. And then like, I really love to go into the sensation. Okay, well, so like that's anxious. So what are the sensations that you're feeling under there? Oh, well, I'm feeling, cause then what we do is we start to connect it back to the body. Yeah. Right, cause you said the body knows. Sure. So you don't really need this. You need this mind for maybe calculating calendars, yeah. Yeah, just right? tasks. memorizing information yeah, lo for lo medical logistical school. Things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't really need it for your wisdom and your, your everyday existence. So it's like, come back. Okay. I'm feeling that in my shoulders. All right. What is the sensation? Oh, I'm feeling that it feels fluttery or it feels tight or it feels heavier. It feels, um, just, uh, like, big. Yeah. And then, okay, if you give it a voice, what would it say? Yeah. And this is a little bit of like a gestalt therapy, but it's like, oh, it would say, you know, I did it yesterday with an architect client of mine. And she's like, she was feeling, um, just the, kind of this, like feeling like, uh, like she gets like this in this lull with, um, projects, like in the space between projects. 
from start to completion. So it's like, okay, where do you feel that, that, that lull in your body? Oh, I feel it here. And then what is it? What does it say? And, and it, it's like, I'm, I'm bored. I'm mm -hmm. lonely. I mm -hmm. want more. I need more or I'm hungry. And then it's like, okay, well then you give it a voice even more. Like I hear you. Right. Just like how it feels probably really good for some of your patients to sit down with you yeah. and maybe just have somebody listen to them. Yeah. Like heart centered listening and really seeing them and witnessing them. I think a lot of times that's all people are really looking 100%, for. Yeah. And I and I feel like that's healing in of itself. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when when someone learns how to bring that same heart centered listening to these parts inside of them that are either hurting or sad or anxious oh, you're, I hear you, you're feeling lonely or you're feeling hungry, you're feeling like you want more, like tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. Like how, how can I support you? How can I help you, right? I'm sure you probably say yeah, that sometimes yeah, yeah, to your yeah, patients. How so. can I support you? How can I help you? Yeah, and, and this whole thing is basically giving our body a voice and sensations a voice. We, and I know I'm very guilty of it, uh, overlooking the body, overlooking the sensations, overlooking the needs, overlooking if I should eat or I'm just bored, like those right. type of things. Right. Yeah, and the body's constantly talking to you. If you can, if you can listen if enough can listen. and learn, I think like that's another big thing that I do with clients is like teach them to start having that dialogue with themselves or with these little aspects inside of themselves. So I always say like you have your own inner boardroom. You have like your perfectionist, you have your judger, you have your whatever, your inner child. Yeah. You have probably like a million different inner childs in, in, inside of you, yeah. like the two year old, the four year old, yeah. the eight year old, the 10 year old, the 15. But like being able to have a relationship like with yourself. So then once she got into, she got into like what was really underneath of that, it was, it was like that, that was her answer. Mm -hmm. She found her own answer to the lull yeah. or to like the, the dis discomfort with that. Yeah. And then it's like, again, you become your own healer. You become your own, your own friend. You become your own like partner. Yeah. Yeah. Every, so everyone listening, um, I urge you and submit that <laughs> why not start with just feeling those sensations in your body, what you're doing and start a, sort of giving it a voice like, mm -hmm. well, what is that sensation? Is it boredom? Is it anxiety? Where is it? And what would it say? Yep. Because by, by personifying those feelings, then we have a better relationship with our body already. Yeah. Right. And, you know, like the breathwork teacher, David Elliott, he always says, like, where awareness goes, energy flows. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, somebody's feeling like if there's like a migraine and you kind of bring like you bring a connection to that and you bring awareness to it, that's where the energy can start to flow. It yeah. can start to go in there. And then, and then if you started to bring in just like a breathwork technique, whether it's the relaxing breath or coherent breath or... Um, box breath, you know, is another popular I've done one. I've box breath. Yeah. Yeah, a breath. I, I just started doing it last week, too. Yeah. So I'm on all of them. Yeah. Because you, you were the catalyst. Well, and I love, you know, I love to just add, like, into the box breath. I mean, it's great for bringing focus to the mind and also keeping the, the body calm. Um, but I also love to bring in, like, the different levels of consciousness and the different elements to it. So, like, when you're breathing in, just imagining your physical, like, breathing into your physical body body yeah. and then as you're holding like allowing yourself to start learning how to create space to be present with the emotional self and then as you exhale out it's like releasing that mental like chatter and then when you hold again it's like you're you're consciously connecting with like your spiritual self or your higher self and then coming so back I right love, to it like bringing that that those yeah. levels of consciousness into like the box breath yeah that's a great that's a great integration to that box breath instead yeah. of just breathing yeah. really paying close attention and then that it. way you can start to connect with like what is happening in my physical body what is happening in the emotional self the mental self the spiritual self yeah. higher self yeah there's a, there's a lot going on so <laughs> we have a lot of selves inside we, of us we do i i, I can <laughs> say that in the in the least uh in the least chaotic of ways yeah there is i really love that you said when we we, we're, we have all those movements and things flowing around inside of us. And sometimes meditation is hard because you kind of just got to sit there with all that stuff. And then one by one, just quiet it down. But breath work is a little bit more active, mm -hmm. right? So you, you're not sitting there in silence with your thoughts. Sometimes it can be very difficult, especially right. if you have 100 <laughs> thoughts a minute. 
But breath work, you're really active and moving and yes. breathing and breathing and breathing. I feel like it gives, would it be, I guess it gives the, the um, maybe the right side of the brain, like the executive mm. functioning, something to do. Mm -hmm. So it gives the body and the brain like something to focus on. Oh, I need to breathe in my belly. I need to breathe in my chest. I need to breathe. Yeah. I need to exhale. I need to keep doing that. I need to keep doing that. And then it allows that, you know, the left side of the brain to be able to start to access some of yeah. what's what's unconscious and what's like creative and what's underneath of it. Yeah, so folks, if you're having trouble meditating, why don't you just start with breath work or getting guidance on breath work um, and then going from there because at the end of it, you're in a really relaxed state. You're pretty much in that Very. meditative state already. There's so many routes to just peace and integration mm -hmm. and truth um, and this is one that's really powerful and I can attest to it. I said yeah. it so many times. I did it. And I love it. I love the, the breath work also too. It, it, it helps with, um, I think it's great for like masculine energy too because what it does is it starts to break apart some of that like excess masculine energy mm -hmm. and just starts to open up the heart a little bit more yeah. and allow you, you know, and, and that may be why you also had that experience of just allowing yeah. the clearing and the release, right? Because the masculine energy is more about like going out, whereas the feminine is more about like receiving and like being within. Yeah, I can... I mean, there was what three guys in the class, so yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, I, the, I the femininity part is definitely yeah. dominant, but um, I mean, I have the awareness that I know the heart for me, yeah. and many times is closed. So you hit it right in the head mm. when you said that. That's most likely what was happening is the opening of the heart the and heart. and wounds and trauma and sadness and and everything just coming out and your, the body going, hey, you've been holding this for ten ten years. Yeah. Let's let's bring it out a little yeah, bit, which it is out. why I'll be coming to the next one too. Yeah. Um, so how do people find you? Let's say they live in Colorado or New York or Tennessee. Mm -hmm. wh what do they do? I would say the best thing is to go to my website, uh, which is gwenditmar.com. And then they can go to services, breath work. There's also coaching. Um, and yeah, just find me through there. There's a link to sign up for breath work individual. We can do it virtually. Um, you know, if they can get a large group of people together and maybe I can come to their city. That's I do cool. regularly go to, I just started going um, to Boston, uh, New York, Philly, New Jersey. Um, it's my my side of the country gone right to there. Baltimore and yeah. I go to DC pretty often. So I do go to the East coast. Um, but yeah, virtual sessions are just as powerful. Um, and then I also do, you know, coaching work. So that's, that's on my website also, or they can always go to Instagram. Instagram is and a And you have a beautiful Instagram. Oh, Really visually you. nice and empowering. So it's a really place like where it. I get to express. For me, that was like what breath work did for me is I always, always used to be very shy, introverted, um, you know, and I, I don't know whether it was this lifetime or other lifetimes, right. but I had a lot of energy around not feeling safe speaking up and not being able to speak up and not being able to use my voice. I mean, I never would have been able to do something like this just even probably four years ago. Ah. Like I would get giant purple splotches like all uh, over yeah. my face. Yeah. yeah, because I was so nervous and scared, but like breath work really, it was like, and again, I had done a lot of modalities and I had pushed myself, right, to like do a blog and have a website and yeah. do certain things. But it was like the breath work really just cleared something that I didn't even know was in there, but that had like kept me very, very protected about, about speaking and sharing and like having a voice. And I find a lot of women have that. They, you know, Throat I think... Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I see it so much. I mean, even some of my closest friends, I'm like, why don't you speak up? Let's yeah. work on you speaking up because, and they have, you know, they, they have so many issues just opening this up. And that's a lot of society too. It know? is. I think and men it's, too, close, right? Close heart society. Right. And so, I th yeah, I think it's just been, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years of, of energy just being passed down that way. Yeah. And then also too, I think sometimes like it's what we, right, what we experience in this lifetime mm -hmm. um, also creates that energy in the body. So a lot of times, like I don't, you know, if, if there is some, some energy that gets um, blocked or traumatized in that second chakra, that also shows up in the throat chakra and being able to speak up because those two are connected. Like yeah. if somebody's working those muscles, it's very hard. If somebody's like tightening that muscle, it's very hard to speak. 
Yeah. So those two are oftentimes connected. Interesting. Really good stuff. So they can find you online. They can yeah. find you on Instagram. You do yes. virtual, which is amazing. You're yes. on the East Coast. I mean, now there's no excuse not to do breath work at this point, right? I Yeah. I also have a podcast. So, you do? Yeah, what's it I called? Do. The Beautiful Grit. Okay. And I do live coaching sessions, like real coaching sessions with people I don't know on on the podcast because I feel like that's something that I've heard a lot of like what is coaching is it therapy is it not therapy what do you actually do what do you talk about mm -hmm. and so I do I coach coach individuals on on the podcast so I and I think it's helpful too for people to be able to hear like what do I do if I'm afraid what do I feel like I what do I do if I'm stuck in my job or if I have trouble opening my heart or yeah. if I'm not able to find love and partnership yeah those are hard questions yeah. sometimes I had no idea how to even start opening up. Um, yeah. I think I'm on a path after meeting excellent mm -hmm. people, influential people like you. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's this always is fun really to be awesome. with you. Yeah. So everyone check her out, check out her amazing work and breath work. You know, that's, that's such a powerful modality. Pay close attention to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oxygen. Oxygen. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone. That was an amazing conversation with an amazing guest and so empowering because now we know that we have tools in front of us to address these things that we don't even know we need to address, right? Our body is such a sacred temple for us. It communicates every time something's off. So I urge you all and submit to you all to be more aware of what your body cues are, what it's trying to tell you. And if that's through breath work, through meditation, through yoga, I don't care what it is, but be more in line with your body. Your body's incredible, way beyond any doctor can comprehend, any engineer can comprehend. So give your body some love. I'm so happy you all came to listen, spend some time with me. I'm forever grateful. As always, I got a lot of love for you. Have a beautiful week.